The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome. This is going to be called the Focus Challenge. This is a new challenge for us. Matter of fact, it wouldn't hurt to do this for 30 days or more. You know, this is not just a one time message here, but it is. And um, Tom shared a, a, a definition that's never left me yet. And uh, talking about a focus challenge. Focus. Focus that needs a perspective. Getting out of focus, right? You know, you've done that with cameras, right? Refocus <laughs> after you've been out of focus. How it comes, some keys to preparing for focus. Focusing in on the real you. That's the new creation you. And focus is really requires seeking. And so... Uh, in other words, we're going to have to apply ourselves this morning. So we're going to learn how to refocus. All right. Point number one, this definition that I've heard that doesn't, it just doesn't leave. Of course, I add a little bit to it. But it's the definition of behold. You see that in your Bible everywhere. Behold. To behold with sustained attention. Oh, I love that. It's like being locked in. To behold with sustained attention attention and the part I'm adding to it until that word becomes a reality and an experience whoa I, I'm not just it's it's and and here's here's the expression you're gonna hear a lot of this because I think it's clever if I think something's clever it will get in every sermon eventually but it's time that we learn to cook and not just read the cookbook you like that it's time we learn to cook, not just read the cookbook. All right? So um, I, if I went into a restaurant, I don't want to just read the menu. I want to eat. I want to drink, right? Eat and drink. And then I want to learn how to prepare that so that other people can eat and drink. I want to learn to cook. I don't want to just read the menu. I don't want to read the cookbook. Why, that'd be torture, wouldn't it, if you're really hungry? Just read the cookbook. All this good stuff's in here. I don't get any of it. Well, learn to cook and you can have some, right? So the definition, behold, with sustained attention. And uh, the very first revelation, I think I had a lot of rejection issues in my life and as a young Christian, but the most purifying word that God gave me after I'd been a Christian a number of years, the most purifying word was... Um, I'd always felt that I was totally ignored by, uh, by my dad growing up. And, you know, people have all kinds of uh, hardships growing up. And how you respond to people growing up makes a difference. You know, it's not just always their fault. It's how did I respond to it. But I grew up feeling invisible and found out later that my dad grew up the same way. His father, uh, he was illegitimate. And so my grandfather, kind of like he was invisible compared to the rest of the kids. He had many... Uh, brothers and sisters after that, but it didn't matter. He was invisible. Like he would say, Dad, I completed college by going to night school. And he'd go, your sister made a wonderful jello salad yesterday. There was something in my grandfather that by not dealing with it made it impossible to acknowledge my father. That was his sin, but didn't know how to properly deal with it. And that's the way it comes out. When you don't deal with your stuff, it comes out on other people, right? So I was the same way. I was born. My dad could pay attention to my two sisters, but I was invisible. It was like it didn't matter, nothing I did. But then after a, a number of years in God, the most life-changing revelation, and I want this for you too, the most life-changing revelation came. And I wept for, for days, and to this day, 40-some years later, this truth is as rich today as it was then, if not richer, because it, it's a progressive reality. God wants you to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God, but here it is. 
Uh, the scripture he gave me was out of the Living Bible, and it was, How precious it is, Lord, to realize that you are thinking about me constantly. Constantly. I can't even count how many times of the day your thoughts are toward me. And when I wake in the morning, you're still thinking of me. And then God used a term that uh, we preached it, that's been developed in different books and manuals uh, as one of seven major revelations, life-changing revelations. But Dennis, I'm giving you my undivided attention. Whoa. Undivided, it means even while I'm sleeping, his thoughts are coming toward me. And the scripture says they're more numerous than the grains of sands on the sea. That's quite a few thoughts, isn't it? And if his thoughts are continually toward me, obviously they're always for good, not for harm. To give me hope, future, and an expected end that is redemptive. <clears throat> So I looked at this, and all I knew is that I was so overwhelmed by it, but I was drinking and feeding it. It wasn't just a thought. It was becoming life to me. And God showed me that for truth to become the reality or to make that word become flesh, that I will give you a truth, and if you ask and inquire, I will teach you how to cultivate that truth. And then you can then attest as a testimony, is there any fruit as a result of that revelation? Has it changed my life? Is there something there to show for? And I know for a fact that focus and intimacy was the fruit that came out of that. It was That's why one of our first books was Practicing the Presence of God 24-7, because that undivided attention toward me uh, brought me to a place of uh, such rich satisfaction that I kept saying, God, I want to reciprocate, but I don't know how to do that. I have to go to work. I've got to sleep at night. I don't know how to give you undivided attention. And he says, yes, you can. I made your spirit able to commune with me 24-7, even when you're sleeping, even when your mind, will, and emotions is kind of uh, involved or engaged. Brother Lawrence did that, but he didn't tell anybody how to do it. I was like, I want to be able to tell people how to do it. Practicing the presence of God, people will say, well, Brother Lawrence did it. Great. How do I do that? It's a little frustrating to just read about what somebody else can do. So God says, we're not just going to read the cookbook. We're going to learn to cook today, aren't we? Hmm? So uh, drink, don't think. Feed, don't just read. You need to make it spiritual application. Um, <clears throat> focused with sustained attention. Your spirit has that capability. Your mind doesn't have that capability. You can't stay focused on one thing indefinitely. So I said, God, teach us about this focus. So I think in the days ahead, uh, we're going to have a focus challenge. Who knows? Uh, we might have a little workbook or something that you can practice. You know, after 30 days, you should be cultivating something kind of new. Even in the natural, they would say you'd have a new habit developed if you could do something for 30 days. How about focus? Because right now, I've never seen so much distraction, whether it's in the political realm, the news realm, uh, the spiritual realm, uh, and most of the negativity and most of the darkness is, will even come through uh, your, your expression, the way you live, the way you respond to things, uh, the way you react. Now, uh, drink, don't think, feed, don't read. You know, Philippians chapter 4 <clears throat> doesn't really tell you how. Again, uh, someone commented on one of our uh, uh, YouTube videos. They said, uh, I've always thought that the, the Bible was great on what, but a little, little lacking on how, <laughs> right? We know what to do. The question is what's really where the education comes is how do I do that, right? And we want to major on that. We feel like that's the primary calling of our ministry. Uh, when we travel, we were even called a how-to people, all right? But you know what? We need that. We need that. We need application. Uh, we know what the Bible says. 
We need to know how to do it. We've even had people, uh, that was one of my favorite emails from, uh, I think it came from Canada, where someone said, I've been a Christian for 45 years now, and here's somebody telling us how to do what I already knew we were supposed to do. Okay, isn't that the case though for a lot of people? If you read your Bible once, you kind of know what you're supposed to do, but doing it is a whole nother realm. And God wants us to practice his presence and, and get it in there. And focus is main. If God gave me seven major revelations and, and giving you my undivided attention was number one, I think there's something in the priority. Don't you think? I think he taught focus. And if he can teach you focus, the rest of the stuff will start to fall into place a little bit better. Philippians 4, 6-8 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through, uh, through Jesus. And finally, brethren, now, now, people tell you, be anxious for nothing, and then they tell you whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, think, focus on these things. So there, there, there's a little homework for you right there. Because God has spoken good things to you. God has given you scriptures in your daily devotions. You can't just uh, write it down and then ignore it and then listen to the news and get all bummed out. All right? That's, that's not what this scripture is saying. It says, be anxious for nothing. Don't give in to that dark spirit. The complete Jewish Bible says, in conclusion, brothers, this is verse 8 in Philippians 4. The complete Jewish Bible says, in conclusion, brothers, focus. <laughs> all right? That's pretty clear. Focus your thoughts on what is true, noble, righteous, pure, lovable, or admirable, or some virtue or something that's praiseworthy. Uh, the voice translation, Hebrews 12, 2. Stay focused on Jesus, <laughs> who designed and perfected our faith, fixing our eyes upon Jesus. Focused with a sustained attention. And that's really the revelation God gave me, but it's available to everybody because you have an anointing and it abides within and it wants to teach you. Why not let it teach you this? Why not let it teach you how to focus so you don't get off track? And uh, in, in this focusing too, keep in mind uh, this focus with sustained attention. Listen to some of the scriptures that you're familiar with, like Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that's what I will seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. There, here's that word, to behold. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. And there's two parts to that, inquiring of his temple. But there's also behold with sustained attention, embracing it until you own it until it's written on the tablet of your heart, until it's become an engrafted word. An engrafted word means it's connected to you now. It's absorbed. It's assimilated. It's written on the tablet of your heart. That's not poetic. That is meant to be transformation that's supposed to take place by the living word of God. Now, uh, I, uh, before we get any further, though, there's a, there's a second element of the focus challenge. Um, and that is focus requires a perspective. This changed my life for me in a very real way when I saw this. In Philippians chapter 3, by the way, I'm expecting all of you to take this and do homework on it because we're going to believe you're going to do this for 30 days. I mean, if you did it for three days, you'd feel better. All right. Philippians 3, 10 to 14. The perspective of his focus had four elements. There was the inward look, not that I have already attained or perfected. So he's focusing on Jesus, but he's also on the real him, the new creation him. He's saying, but I haven't already arrived. Good start if you're going to focus on God. Some of the people we saw that made the least amount of progress literally had a spirit of pride that I already know that. I have a better way, you know. Those, are, those can be very good excuses, all right? It's not about what you know. Do you know how to cook? It isn't about, I read the cookbook. 
I know that verse. I can quote that verse. I used to see people like, oh, we're real good at quoting, but not good at living it. All right? You need to learn to cook, not just read the cookbook. All right? Now, the inward look is, I have not already attained. So here's the Apostle Paul getting focused. And the first thing he focuses on, humility, I haven't arrived yet. I'm not where I want to be. That should be true of you too, right? You're not where you want to be. You should be wanting more. So the inward look is a focus of where you're at as a new creation, sons and daughters. The second one is a backward look. I do not count myself to apprehend it, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind is not negativity. Uh-oh, listen to me. Forgetting those things which are behind are past accomplishments. You want to move forward? You can't just rest on the laurels of previous accomplishments. Previous accomplishments are in the past. I'm not going to focus on that. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. I came from the tribe of kings. If anybody, oh, da, da, da. But I consider that stuff rubbish compared to the excellency of knowing him, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with him. That's the kind of passion that should be in each and every one of us if we're focused. So there's the inward look. I haven't already arrived. There's the backward look. I do not count myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting everything that was accomplished behind and pressing on to what lies ahead. And that brings us to the, the, uh, the forward look. That I might press on to lay hold for that which Messiah Jesus laid hold of me. I want to, my focus has to be on what did he call me to do? And some of you that have like been under a cloud of darkness have lost sight of what God called you to do. This, this perspective will get you focused. What did God call you to do? Make it even easier. What was the last thing he told you? What was the last scripture he gave you? How are you doing with that? Was it just information? Was it mere talk? Or was he trying to say, I'm available for a deeper relationship. That's why I gave you that scripture. Are you just reading the cookbook, or are you going to learn to cook? Are you going to feed instead of read, drink instead of just think, and let that word become flesh? This is too spiritual for a lot of head people, okay? I understand that, because it's requiring, it's requiring pursuing experience over mere knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I want to know the lover of my soul. I want to know him in greater dimension than ever before. The upward look. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Messiah Jesus. There's an upward call. When, when it says, uh, put your mind on things above, it doesn't mean live in la-la land. Put your mind on things above, it means that I am already well acquainted with that my source is within me, but my worship and my attention is going to be that upward stairway, that upward call in Jesus of what he's called me to do. I want to say at the end that I've walked that walk and that I just didn't talk to talk and that I finished my course and I fought a good fight. That's the upward call. The upward call starts from the inside and is released. When I worship God, I don't worship Jesus down here. I let that worship from down here rise up into the heavenly realm, create an atmosphere that's conducive. So we have the inward look, the backward look, the forward look that I might lay hold of it, and the upward look. That would be healthy for anybody to take five minutes in their prayer time and just evaluate. Take those four. They're all focusing in on God, but evaluate from there. All right. Now, I want to uh, cover some things that I've covered before because uh, I covered so much material. A lot of people told me I've got to listen to that uh, three more times. Uh, so I'm going to take some things from that were previously taught and expand them. All right. And the third element of focus is being out of focus. <laughs> All right. So we already have the focus challenge, point one for you note takers. Point two is focus requires perspective. We gave you the inward, the outward, the forward, the upward look. But now what happens when you get out of focus? Oh, that could never happen to me, everyone says, right? 
Okay, it happens to the best of the best. And who are you to say that it never happens to you? All right. So let's cover that. We covered this once before, but keeping in mind that the problem is, uh, is, is that you have weaknesses in your flesh. And if circumstances and people come your way and it's not working out well, it's tailor-made for you. You know, the devil and you know your weaknesses better than anybody. All right? God doesn't tempt anybody. So you can't blame God, even though some people like to do that. They think they have a right to play God and blame God. But anyway, God can't heal excuses. Now listen to this. We're, we've done this before, but I want to go slow with this. Jeremiah, I'm too young. Jeremiah 1, I'm too young. Moses, who am I that I should go? Moses, but I can't speak. None of them were, by the way, in all of these excuses, God gave the same answer, we covered that, that I am with you. He didn't give them a different answer, I am with you. So your excuses really don't hold up. <laughs> but you have different kinds of excuses. You're such a creative people, right? Everybody has their own unique excuse. Oh, Lord, I cannot speak. I'm not a talker. Gideon, I'm the weakest and the smallest. Gideon, I'm afraid. I know none of these excuses have ever applied to any Christians that I know. Joshua, I like this one. Joshua was a detemperament. And the best thing you can do with a mover and a shaker is put him under Moses. Put him as a subordinate. A natural born leader needs to be mentored by a leader. It'll crucify his flesh real nice. Then after he gets his flesh crucified, he, he works all those years under Moses. Then he goes, then God tells him to do something. And he goes, the people will oppose me. Somebody might not like me. That was one of my first revelations. I was a baby Christian, and I figured, I love God, and I love these people. Everybody's got to love me. Found out real quick that isn't true. They don't. <laughs> and you better not go, people are going to oppose me. There's people that don't like me. Oh, dear. Okay. That's Joshua. But my favorite of all favorites, and it's worth repeating, we covered this in, a, in the previous message, but I just love it. It's like, do you think Jesus would appear to you in a vision and small talk? If he appeared to you in a vision, trust me, he would read your mail. And guess what? He knows what you're thinking, and he knows what you're going to do before you do it, right? So listen to this one, Paul, Acts 18, verses 9 and 10. The Lord spoke to Paul in a night vision. Do not be afraid. Speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. <laughs> do you think he was just small talking? Or do you think he was reading Peter's mail? That's what I believe. Peter was over there going, I'm tired of talking. Paul, I'm tired said the Apostle Paul. This is what's going on in his head. Or why would Jesus say that if that wasn't going on in his head? I'm tired of talking. I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to stay silent. These people are hurt. I'm tired of being hurt. You know what happened the last time? You know how many times I got beat up? Uh, these people hurt. I'm afraid. I'm the only one, too. I'm all by myself. Oh, no one's ever said that. I'm all alone. Nobody understands. I am with you. I said no one will attack you. And I have many people in this city. Kind of cuts right through all of your excuses, doesn't it? Well, God wants to cut through all of your excuses. And trust me, you have them. And they're tailor-made for you. They may not be like everyone else's. I'm too young. I'm too old. Uh, I, I, I can't talk. I'm weak. I'm small. All right? But this is the part that I think is important to understand. 
My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. But all temptation is tailor-made. But it hinders what we were called to do. And we have to see that. Because now let's look back at the Jeremiah, Moses, Gideon, Joshua, Paul, even Elijah. That was another good one. one. After poof, the fire coming down on the wet sacrifice and poof, all this poof, poof, signs and wonders. And then Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. And he runs. Makes you wonder what his mother was like. And he runs from Jezebel. And he's in a cave going, it just... I'm no better than my father's. Kill me. Why don't you just take my life now, God? What a pity party. This is the great man. If it can happen to the greats, don't tell me it didn't happen to you ever. Don't tell me you're not even going through some of that right now. Stinking thinking, but you can refocus. You can. Redemption is the name of the game. It's never changed. There's hope for every one of us. All right? Jeremiah, I'm too young. You know what he told him? Do not be afraid of their faith. This is what he was not doing while he was, this is God's answer. Not only am I with you, but I told you to go preach, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to tear down, to build and to plant. And don't be afraid of their faces. You get afraid of their faces, I'll confound you in front of them. Whoa. I'm too young. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's stopping you from doing what God called you to do. What about Moses? Who am I? Should I go? What's God say? You go tell Pharaoh. <laughs> Set my people free. Just think, who am I that I should go? Is standing in the way of your calling. In every case, when you are out of focus and you're locked in on some excuse that you think is factual, and it may be factual, you are hindering the purpose that God had for you. You need to be seeing what's on the other side of that barrier, obstacle, offense, sin. <laughs> oh, Lord, I cannot speak. You tell Pharaoh. Oh, apparently God's going to be with his mouth. He said, I'm with you. Gideon, I'm afraid. Oh, mighty man of valor. <laughs> Boy, God, God really messed with all of them, didn't he? But he was refocusing them on what their purpose was and what their call was and how their excuses were keeping them out of focus and even saying, I don't know what God wants. I don't hear from God. Guess what? I know why. Because you're listening to another voice. The voice of the world, the voice of the flesh, could even be the voice of religion. But I'll tell you what, it's not the voice of God if it's, if it's obscuring that relationship. My sheep hear my voice. So God's saying you've got to refocus on the call because these excuses are forfeiting your anointing and you have an anointing and it abides within. I want to quote a scripture on how this works when you listen to the wrong voice and you need to refocus. Uh, the, the, my favorite is in the message translation. We know it in James as, you know, lust when it's conceived gives birth to sin. Okay, listen, to it. in the message translation it says, lust gets pregnant. Lust gets pregnant has a baby, sin. Sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. What you need to see is the progression of growth. We want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God, but if you don't deal with your stuff, it grows. And it's out to rob, kill, and destroy. So what starts as a little, I want to, I want it my way, can grow up into a killer. So I suggest there's two ways to live. I would take God's way. There is a way that seems right, but its end is destruction. So go God. All right? So refocus on your call. So Father, right now, I'm going to even pray at that fourth element. You know, we've talked about the focus challenge. We're, we're, we're saying the focus requires perspective. We're saying it's easy to be out of focus because even the greats got out of focus. So don't tell me you can't ever get out of focus, that you're above that. That's just a spirit of pride. 
And that will keep you from fulfilling your purpose too. I could still remember ministering to a man who says, well, you don't understand. I'm complicated. And I'm saying, well, that's good you're complicated because the kingdom of God is simple. To bring down that haughty spirit, pride is rooted in Satan. Humility is rooted in God. Pick one. You can either stay proud or you can humble yourself. The people that have amounted the least in their Christianity were people who are extremely knowledgeable but applicable, no. Didn't apply what they knew. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Wisdom is the principal thing, not knowledge. Knowledge can puff up. But love is the redemptive application in the kingdom. Now, so the fourth element is that you've got to refocus on the call. Can you see where this was messing up? God wanted Paul to continue. You're not done yet. But he was going to quit. He wasn't going to talk no more. I'm tired of getting beat up. Now, if God comes to you in a vision and says, you're not going to get beat up. Keep talking. You're not done yet then, right? That's what he needed to focus on. Now, in Paul's case, Elijah, Joshua, Gideon, Jeremiah, these are not wishy-washy Christians, were they? And if it can happen to them, it can happen to you. You better know how to get out of it. You can run person to person to get you out of it, or you can learn how to refocus. Refocus on the call that God has for you. The fifth element, the, the, that loss of focus, is temptation. And it starts with lust. But as we've seen in the message translations, lust can grow into a real problem. A real killer. Lust can get pregnant. Lust can give birth to sin. Sin can grow up. Oh, you mean it can get worse? Yeah. It can grow and become a real killer. So all temptation that's tailor-made for you, it wants to hinder what you're called to do. So the loss of focus is temptation. It starts as mild as temptation. The good news is, and all temptation is tailor-made to hinder what God called you to do, but here's five keys about temptation. Be a note-taker, write down these five keys. First of all, key number one, what do we do about temptation? Recognize there's no independent self. An independent self is you are a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. Too often, uh, we feel like we get stuck. Stuck is an impossibility. Jesus doesn't get stuck. He walks through walls. What stuck means, when you say, I started to pray through something and I got stuck. What you're saying is, Part of me wanted to and part of me didn't. Part, the part of me that wanted to was the one who was praying. The real you loves God and loves his word. That part of you wanted to, but then when it started to hurt a little bit, you got stuck. No, what you said was, my flesh says I don't want to. I'll wait till later, some other time. You know what? It can grow in the meantime. God has a, a wisdom about what he reveals to you. Search me, O oh God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. When he shows you something, it's wiser to deal with it than to put it off. Because it will become an excuse, and it will stand between you and what God has for you. All right? So that first key is, when we're weak, he's strong. We beautiful thing about Temptation is, it's not sin. And that's a good start, isn't it? Temptation is not sin. And because you're, not, you're a new creation and you're walking that reality that I'm a new creation, you become not sin conscious, you become son conscious. And here's something coming against me, the son or daughter of God. All right? Instead of getting all wiped out on the temptation. I like to say when temptation comes, that's not me. 
you, you can you can really cut it short quickly. All right. So the key number one is when he's weak, we're strong, and we operate out of that new creation. Um, the second key is a very challenge, but it's that because temptation isn't sin, I have a response, a biblical response. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. <laughs> so, wait a minute, what are you trying to tell me? Well, if temptation is not sin and you're being tempted, consider pure joy that now you have an opportunity to respond in a godly way. I don't think we all look at trials like that, do we? But it is in the scripture, isn't it? Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. That the testing of your faith produces something. It's redemptive. It'll teach you to cook. It'll teach you to drink and to feed instead of just reading the cookbook. And pointing to that and go, whoa, look at that scripture, whoa. <laughs> Only when our reaction to temptation is sinful do we fall into sin. All right? You're going to get the victory as a new creation over temptation. You're going to consider pure joy. <laughs> That's not me. All right, the third key. This is a real uh, interesting key. It's inevitable. What? Yeah, temptation's inevitable. Oh, there's, you mean there's no escape? Not until you're with Jesus, okay? It's inevitable. Each one is tempted by his own evil desire, and he is dragged away and enticed, all right? I always thought that that, that key was interesting because the counter to it is that God has, what did uh, Madame Goyon call that? The law of central tendency, meaning the gravitational pull of God is greater than the pull of temptation. So temptation is trying to, oh, donuts. Mm, ah, oh, Jesus. His pull is greater. You guys, get back here, Dennis. <laughs> get, let's focus. Focus. Huh? That's a, that's a much, much better. All right. The, uh, that's the third key. Temptation is inevitable. The fourth key is that keeping power is greater than your flesh. God's ability to keep you down in the heart, in the secret place, is greater magnetic power than temptation is. So don't say, oh, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going. Uh, his keeping power is greater. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Sorry, you're going to lose that argument. All you're saying is, I want what I want, and I want it now. Well, you know, that's called lust. <laughs> lust will give birth. <laughs> All right? The fifth key is if temptation, and this is something I want you to do your homework on, if temptation seems particularly strong and you find yourself in a repetitive cycle, all right? The same kind of temptation, we can assume that there's a root issue there. And you say, God, where did I give that place? You deal with the root, you get rid of the fruit. Repetition is a sign that you haven't dealt with the root. That same old, same old. And your same old, same old may be different from other people's same old, same old. But nevertheless, what is it? Temptation is tailor-made for you. Your weaknesses, God wants to be your strength. His grace is sufficient for your weakness. But your weaknesses are very evident to your flesh <laughs> and the enemy. However, the enemy doesn't have to uh, work too hard on some people because your flesh beat yourself up quite efficiently. Of course, you'll come in and agree with it. All right? And the other counterfeit is activity, sacrifice. Psalm 40, verse 6 
in the Amplified it says, sacrifice and offering you do not desire. You don't have any delight in them. I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. So don't make, try to compensate with activities, with uh, accolades or manipulations, because it'll, it'll ring untrue. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your uh, feigned behavior. I don't want you to put on your Christian face. I want you to hear and obey what I've given you. Number seven, the seventh element, a focus on the new creation being the real you. We've emphasized this a little bit, but we have to emphasize it a whole lot more. All right, part of you wants to, part of you don't. What part are you going to agree with when you come into that kind of a condition? The real you that loves God and loves his word. That, if you memorize that, if you wrote that down, you would never get stuck without having a godly solution and knowing that greater is he that's in you and you have an anointing and it abides within you and the solution's in there and his keeping power is greater than your lust. But the, the selfish person doesn't want to deal. Don't agree with that part. That's flesh. The real you, if you're born again, are joined to the Lord, you're one spirit with him, the real you loves God and loves his word, does it not? And even people that struggle in a one-on-one in -on -one, uh, ministry session, I can appreciate that. But the point is, the part you should be looking at is that you even bothered to make a one-on-one. -on -one. That says the real you wants to do what's right. So then all of a sudden you get hit with something, whoa, I don't know if I want to deal with that. Deal with it. And you know, the good news is, the, the best part, many of you have screwed up during your Christian walk. Some of you more severely than others. But guess what? Once you have forgiven and it's under the blood, the devil won't bring it up. Oh, he might try, but God won't. God won't bring it up. Why? Because it's covered under the blood. It's remission of sin. There's a historical record, but the heavenly record is clean. Paul, what did God say in the scriptures? Um, David was a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Our flesh would question that, wouldn't it? We'd say, well, wait a minute, David committed murder and adultery. That was forgiven and cleansed between him and God. And when that was cleansed and forgiven, the enemy might bring it up, but God will never bring it up. The Holy Spirit is going to bring up something that's been cleansed and washed. Is that worth getting rid of stuff? Get along with God and get rid of it. So he can say, now, he doesn't erase it from your head so that you don't do it again. <laughs> By reason of reproof, correction. That's what the scriptures are there for. It tells us that David did it, but God's not reckoning it to him, David is a man after my own heart. To all my Abraham staggered not at the promises. Oh, yes, he did. Historically. But the word says Abraham staggered not at the promises. He was cleansed. He was forgiven. He walked by faith and obeyed God. We need to deal with the real us. Needs to deal with offenses that have taken place in the church. If you need to make a list, you'd be making a list because some of these have happened to a huge majority of believers. Offenses toward the church. That's a beautiful excuse for you not to deal with you. Somebody in the church. Somebody in my family. I got hurt in the church. I, what's your point? Get healed up by Jesus. Those, those, their excuses didn't. Those people hurt me. You think Paul didn't have that thought at one point or another? Of course he did. Jesus appeared to him in a vision. These people hurt me. Deal with it. Get on with your life. You've got things to do, places to go, people to see, <laughs> ministry to perform. 
You put up walls in a hostile environment. You refuse to open redemptively to somebody. Peace should be the legitimate wall. And that might mean that you might need to set boundaries. But peace is still what guards your heart and your mind. You don't have to prove a point. One of the most misunderstood concepts, I believe, scripturally, when we traveled particularly, was failing to understand the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. They are not the same. Forgiveness can be one way, like Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Everybody that he forgave did not necessarily reconcile. <laughs> you think you can force reconciliation? You are sadly mistaken. But there's people that are so domineering, they think they can. That ain't God. That's a control spirit. You don't make reconciliation. <laughs> reconciliation requires trust that has to be built off when trust was broken over a long period of time. And it may or may not happen. Forgiveness sets you free. It does not guarantee somebody else's response. You may forgive some people that were mean as a snake to you. They may still be mean as a snake to you. Your obligation to forgive is still there to set you free. Remember we used to get phone calls, Stina knows, we'd get phone calls on uh, people that didn't really listen too much of our stuff and they made phone appointments. I want you to pray that my brother-in-law burns in hell, or I want you to pray that my sister-in-law learns her lesson. I want... I think you might have an issue that it would be wise if you prayed through it. Surprise, surprise. We have found the problem. It is you. <laughs> they may be evil, but your response is worse. <laughs> it's vindictive. It's manipulative. It's all the things of the devil. Rob, kill, destroy. <laughs> uh, trying to change other people. All the years of ministry, I've never tried to change anybody. I simply have given them the tools to change. The, it's up to them. They're God's servants, not mine. They belong to him, not to me. God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God's able to make them do as they should. I can't make them do anything as they should. I can hear the parents now going, Oh, yes, I can. You watch that little kid of mine. Well, you know... <laughs> You have an obligation even with that child to be a steward, not an owner. And to steward that child, to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, you set the example. Teach them the things that are pleasing to God. If they follow suit, they will have learned what pleases God. If not, what are you going to do about it? They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him, not to you. No. The eighth element, focus on the God inside and what he does. Oh, I love this section. My favorite railroad track scripture was Philippians 3.10, particularly in the Amplify. And talk about focus. He gave me one thing to do. Isn't that interesting? I had all these ideas of what I should be doing in Christianity when I was a young Christian. He only gave me one thing to do. Sometimes I think that's a lot smarter. Do this one thing and the other things will come fall into place. And he gave me Philippians 3.10. For my determined purpose is that I might know him, that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding all of the wonders of his personhood. That's when I got dove into the names of God and said, I want to walk in the reality of those names. I don't want to memorize the names of God. I want to have experiential knowledge that far exceeds mere knowledge. I want to have experiential knowledge of those names because those names match his nature, and I want that nature written on the tablet of my heart. Now, here's some of the things that focus uh, does when you become God-inside-minded, so to speak. The first thing that it does, you say, okay, now, 
uh, right at this point on focus, you know what to do, what not to do, this should encourage you as to why bother? Because what we deal with in Christians is a lack of effort. And in most cases, it's like, I don't, why do I have to do all that? That's a 60 day challenge. Oh, that sounds like too much work. I can't give 60 days of my, well, what are you going to do for 60 days? The next 60 days, you're going to do something. If that's too much, that tells me a whole lot about your effort. Um, and, but here's what it does. If you can learn to go to that secret place, if you can learn to put on the Lord Jesus and stay focused on him, what if it's only 30 seconds? What if it's only a minute? Here's what you start doing in that one minute. It makes me want to do two minutes and three minutes and four minutes. But here's what happens if you even do it one minute. Once you meet him, this is where you meet God. This is where he meets you in your heart, the innermost being. First thing he does is he cleanses. While I don't feel a scrubbing, but while I'm focused on him, I'm getting cleaner. It even says if I walk in this light and have fellowship, the blood will continually cleanse me. I'm focused on him and I'm getting cleaner. I've been getting clean now for 30 seconds. Wow, that makes me want to get clean a little bit more. It's available, you know. I don't know how you clean your house or what you clean your car or whatever, but I think God wants us to detail it. <laughs> I think he wants us to get really intricate with this cleansing. Oh, and what's happening? While I'm being cleansed, there's another element. I'm being protected. I can feel his peace. Oh, his peace is putting up an invisible armor that will guard my heart and my mind. Oh, I think I want more of that. My mind and my heart need guarded, trust me. I can go astray very easily in my heart. So, I, oh, I'm going to 30 seconds, uh, God is protecting. Oh, I can feel his peace. I think I want to stay there a little longer than 30 seconds. It's so good. Oh, you know what else it's doing? I didn't know this, but while I'm down there, he's discerning my motives. Uh oh. That's why I do what I do. Oh, well, I like being clean and protected, and he's messing with my motives. But you know what? I'm exchanging my motives, if they're not real pure, for his motive, which is love. Does any, oh, maybe it'd be nice to live with his motive over my motives. <laughs> His motive is always love and redemptive. He's changing my motive. Oh, whoa. And not only that, but while he's changing my motive, he's discerning my heart. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we give an account. Oh, I like that part. Mm. Oh, it's bringing a sense of satisfaction. That's the next one. Satisfaction. He's my exceedingly great reward. Whoa, this is good. I'm getting him, not stuff. I'm having him relationally. Whoa. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Ah, oh, it's liberating me. This is the kind of freedom that I wanted all along, and I tried to get it with my self-energy, and it didn't work. All I did was get exhausted and burned out. But now I'm feeling liberated and free. And all I'm doing is allowing him to focus, allowing myself to focus on the Jesus in me. Oh, while he's down there, he just healed something. Oh, oh, I received forgiveness for that. Lord, thank you for showing me that. You, you know, boy, I'm really getting free here. I didn't even know I needed that. Oh, that's why it's good to have him search your heart instead of you. Oh, while you're down there, let him look around. He's going to search all the innermost rooms of the belly. He does that, you know. Oh, 
Okay. Oh, what's in that? What's behind that door, Dennis? Okay, God, you can come in. You. Uh, oh. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's where I was angry at that guy on the road. Okay, cleanse that. Oh, I feel so liberated. I'm so glad I forgave that guy on the road. I didn't even know that was in there. But that's what you do, God. Best. You search me. Search me for you know. Oh, I feel so good. I'm healed. Oh, God says, yeah. And he said, you know what else you're doing right now? You've been down here for 30 seconds or more. You're winning the battle. Oh, I am? Oh, mighty man of valor, mighty woman of valor. You are winning the battle. This is spiritual warfare. Not shouting at the dark. Not giving negative prophetic words. That's not, that's not accomplishing anything. What you're doing, you're doing that out of fear and anger. This is winning the war out of the love of God. Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus. Whoa. This is real warfare flowing out of the love of God, dispelling darkness. Hmm. Messiah in me is the hope of glory. Whoa. And you know what else God says? While you're here, you're in my glory. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches. Where are they at? In the glory. You're in there. Oh, thank you, God. I am sinking into you and putting on incorruption, immortality, the armor of light, putting on the Lord Jesus, putting on the whole armor, putting on the new man, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, putting on tender mercies, putting on bonds of perfection. Boy, I am clothed. I am clothed. I am. It's all God, too. All right? The ninth area. Focus redirects require seeking. And this is good for note takers. I'm going to cover this real quickly. That in this area, what's important to understand is that Psalm 105, verse 4. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Bill Morford, when he wrote the One New Man Bible, said the thing that's missing from context in our English Bibles is continually. It's not just ask, seek, knock. It's ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep Walk in the Spirit continually, continually, continually. It was meant to be a flow. We did a book called uh, Flowing in the River of God's Will because it's not just choppy little do this, then you can do that, and then do It's a flow. It's like being in a river. Now, God's saying, seek there's three different words for seek. In the Old Testament, seeking in the Lord means to inquire or search carefully for something. The second Hebrew word is to request something. So you're seeking him carefully for something. You're making a request, but you're also uh, seeking him uh, to feel or to grope or to touch or to have relationship with him. And in the New Testament, it's Acts 17, 27. Oh, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him, although he's not far from him. That's what we're doing today. That's focus. All right? So how are we going to refocus? One, two, three. Some of you use the blue card. Use the blue card. Do whatever it takes, but one... Obey the last thing you heard. Come on, you have scripture, you, you pay attention, you have daily devotions. Do the last thing, absorb it, feed on it, learn to cook, don't just read the cookbook. Remove barriers. And get back into focus. How do you get back in focus? Remove the barriers. That's what he did with all the greats. One, two, three. Focus on the last thing God said. Remove the barriers and get back into image. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.